Yes, I want to talk a little bit. I'm talking a little bit like some K theory and what it tells you about some kind of categorification of calculus that everyone knows from undergrad life. So let me do a bit of a plan so people know what's happening. So anytime my writing is too small, just let me know. So the first part is one built by the um, topological K theory. The second part we'll see when, as we're going through it, unrelated, but it's all going to be about a, a particular categorification. Calculus. And the third part, in terms of the title, and it's going to tell you what the first part tells you about the second part. And if there's time at the end, there'll be a bonus section that will look at some other calculi and find the all related to each other. Okay, so let's get started with um, the first part by not looking at how much with K theory, but we're looking at how spread theory. Let's maybe take four as a ring. So I can look at this category of modules over my ring. And inside there, I can look at modules which are projected. If they mean that, find some other module. Such that there's some three so this forms a nice little subcategory of these modules, the projected ones. So I can look at projected modules. I can then start looking at isomorphism classes of these things. And if I really want. Convert complete the whole thing. Like script completion. And this is what people call the zero table of my ring four. Are you assuming that the ring is commute? Uh, no, if, it, if you don't want to be committed, just choose left or right. But if you want committed, then committed is fine. But finitely generated. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm finally generated here. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So, the first one example of this that everyone should know is that the zero K group. Of the field is integers. Because modules over a field are vector spaces, and vector space finally generated for fan dimensional vector spaces have a dimension. Okay. Oh, so, why are you saying that it doesn't make sense if you do not prefer fan to generate? Things go weird with infinite dimensional things. Zero group. Right. Well, that's another thing that makes sense. It's a trivial. <coughs> uninteresting. Right. Well, well, it's 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 it makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay. So, algebraic K theory. So, the goal of mine is to go along and every you see ring replace it with topological space. Give some kind of topological version of this. So, let's maybe see how this works. Thank you. 
let's take some space x that says compact um, now this might be a surprise to some people, but a space is not a ring. Yeah, it's just not. Um, but there is a ring that you can give to a space. So we can look at the what's called two x. This is continuous functions from x to let's just say n field a. And let's assume k is the real or the complex numbers. This is a ring. It just inherits the ring structure from complex numbers. And so we have a ring. Let's play the same trick with that ring. So what I can look at is the collection of finitely generated projective modules over this ring of continuous functions. So there's actually a little neater way to package this up. It's the same data by a theorem, I guess, due to Sayre and Swan. Swan is to believe Wikipedia. And this is the same thing as K vector bundles. Over the space we started. I guess I also need back So we can then just find the zero Kager. This time I'm going superscript rather than subscript. Relative to my choice of field of my space to just be, I take all these. Uh, dimensional vector bundles over my space because isomorphism passes with those convert complete, which is the same thing as playing playing out to a case for this. Let's so examples. One more. So an example, the new paper of the one point space is the integers. So every talk is supposed to include a proof, right? This is like the saying people say, this is what I will prove today. I'll leave all the difficult stuff to everyone else. So vector bundles, so k vector bundles over a point is the same thing as looking at uh, k vector spaces. And, and then if you look at k vector spaces, and some more and passes with those, well, the natural numbers, again, by dimension, I have mentioned library, of course. And then if you group complete this, the group completion of natural numbers is the integers. Of course, you can do harder things. Let's say you can look at what we do with complex numbers of the one circle. 
And this should be here. No, she also did. Here Unless I'm not doing something else, but nevertheless. Let's say you do S chain. Uh, this is polynomial algebra or ring on one generator. Modulus of relation. I'm going to get this wrong. H minus one squared. This is linked to something called Bach periodicity, which will appear in approximately 30 seconds. Okay. So my choice of calling these things K0 is a little suggestive. That means there should be a Km for some so pants. Let me tell you how that's defined. So K. So we're counting backwards because this is something that quantum theorists and other ecologists like to do is count backwards. So k minus n, you should just take your space, take its n full of suspension, and then I put the zero to k group of that. Now, arbitrarily adding on suspension of things is going to make it kind of awkward to actually compute anything. That's where Bach comes in and solves all your problems. Well, at least some of your problems. So Bach tells you, well, he tells you two things, but uh, if you're the complex numbers of the real numbers. So he tells you that, um, K zero, uh, let's do the complex numbers. The two useful suspension of X is, well, it's by definition K minus two X. This is the zero K group C of X two. Answer with the zero paper. Probably means I'll look at something else, somewhere, but whatever. Somewhere. Oh, yeah, I'm being super lazy with reduced and unreduced. And this should be reduced paper. So I can do a fiber of the map from K theory at the point. But it should be everywhere, I guess. Everywhere this. should be reduced. So in particular, then the K theory of S2 becomes, the reduced one becomes just Z. Yes. Okay, he also tells you what happens in the, the game reduced over real. So for complex things, you learn to care about double suspensions, and for real things, you learn to care about eightfold suspensions. Or up to and including eightfold suspensions. So let me write this in a slightly better way. So this theorem of Bach implies that let's take the complex case. So this is either the zero k group this, and if n is zero mod two, or c. You have the paper of suspension or the minus one paper if 
as one month later. Okay, any questions? Okay. So this is all well and good. This is a thing. You can do the thing. Gives you something to think about. This actually turns out to be an invariant of spaces. Let me very briefly talk about invariants. Okay, so there are arguably three different types of invariance spaces. This one everyone likes, it's easy to define. This one we don't do. More about the type groups. Homotopy groups are hard to compute once you get above like pi one. At least for me, above pi zero is where the real challenge starts. So you have things that are hard to define, but then easier to compute. So you have your own homology groups, or then just like homology. And sitting inside this collection of cohomology here is exactly this thing that we talked about in case. So let me maybe say some words on cohomology theories um, because they look up in part two again. That can be useful to say some stuff about them. Okay. Let me try and say what the homology here is. I'll put this in quotes, but it's not really that. So homology theory it's a contravariant functor. Let me turn it by the star from top of the spaces to so the base point to the greater than the groups. And it satisfies a bunch of properties. So it is a homotopy invariant. This is where my memory stops. It's additive, which means that when we look at a wedge of this is we get product of spaces. If that's has some kind of exactness properties, which I will write down, and some excision properties, which I also will write down. So, for you to tell me or me to tell you what cohomology theory is, you have to tell me a functor and show that that size a bunch of properties. And in practice, these properties can be kind of tricky to verify if you get some kind of exotic. Software in mind. But there is a solution to this slightly difficult to verify statement. At least at least philosophically solution. And it comes in the form of a 
theorem. And what this essentially says is that specifying the information of a cohomology theory is the same thing as specifying a sequence of spaces it is called a sequence D, uh, and maps on the nth term of that sequence to loops on the n plus first term. And possibly depending on what your definition of stacker is, a couple of. So this data is what people call spectra or a spectrum. Sometimes it's called an omega spectrum, depending on what you read. So at least on a philosophical level, this site seems like an easier thing to tell someone, right? It's just here's a bunch of spaces, here's some maps. Not here's a Bunker with a bunch of properties that you have to go off and verify. So just as a as a note, this will come up later. If we started looking at the zero space of this sequence, well, we know by these maps that this is loops on the first space, but the first space is loops on the second space. And the second space is loops on the third space. So we can keep adding loops everywhere. In which case, this E0 is called an infinite loop space. As we keep going and making it a loop space of something else. So, notation for this sometimes will be loops infinity of E, where E is my notation for the sequence of spaces. This will come up later. We'll see some infinite loop spaces as examples of things. Any questions? Okay, so Now when I think about cohomology theories, I'm really going to be talking about spectra or omega spectra. So this is kind of in which the world in which stable homotopy theory lives. So I told you that K theory was a um, cohomology theory, but it has associated spectra I'm just introduce the notation for these guys. So the K theory over and a complex topology of K theory. Its spectrum is uppercase KE. And the real version, its spectrum is uppercase KA. Right? So the rest of the talk, you don't have to know what these things are, but these things are actually related to each other in a useful way. And it's precisely this relationship that's going to tell us some relationships in. The categorifications I want to talk about later. So there are maps on spectra. So the first one goes from KO to KU, and this is induced by. Uh, complexification of vector spaces. Some of these zeroth k groups were 
defined in terms of vector bundles. So compactification of vector spaces also is compactification of vector bundles, and this gives you a map coming up into the level of spectra. And it has its friend going backwards from KU to KO, which is induced by the realification for decompactification. But just forgets that a compact space has a compact multiplication. This looks at it as a real. If you want to get real fancy, these are all ring objects in this category of spectra, and you can think of these as ring maps and all sorts of fancy technological things. Okay, any questions about K theory before I forget about it for the next 10 minutes? All right, hey. Well, that one for two. So we're going to now talk about some categorifications, or at least one, of calculus from underground lifestyle. So think about what a calculus was. Well, you have some function, and you want to look at the rate of change, or you want to write these polynomials. I'm going to tell you that you can do this, but in more abstract settings when we look at functions. So this is part. Okay, so let's let's go back to maybe high school. I'm not sure. Not high school in Ireland, but maybe <laughs> high school somewhere else. Let's take a map of real value functions. Well, a map of a high real value function. They also don't teach English in Irish high school department. So, a real value function. You know what the derivative of this thing is? This is limit over some of the college H. So this means B is a subset of the real numbers here? Yes. Okay. So the derivative is this thing, and this is measure of the rate of change of what your function is doing, right? You add on a small thing, you send the thing to zero, and it's supposed to tell you how, you, how this function changes. Okay, so this is the rate of change perspective. But the other perspective is um, Taylor's theorem. So what it says is that your function is really the limit. Um, and then goes to infinity of what you call the piano x, where piano x is some um, some I just expanded zero to make it uh, easier. I've also chose that indexing because I have an i factorial. But anyway, some finite sum of things in your derivative. Okay. Now, the punchline of everything I'm going to say next is that for certain classes of functors, this all makes sense. You can play the exact same thing. You can think about rate of change, and we'll give you a complete Taylor's theorem for these things. That's actually, in some sense, something you can calculate. So let me do this. Not 
we'll split this in half. Okay. Let's kind of figure out what the key things happening over here are, and then we'll look at the analog things, go to functors, and try and match some things up. So let me say potential. Um, okay, so thing we start off with, well, let's just say it's a function in the real line, the real line, and we choose some expansion point. So let me just be lazy and choose zero as my expansion point. And today, all I'm going to tell you about is functors from vector spaces over some fields to the category of base spaces, where the field K is the reals or the complexes. Reals or the complex number. Okay. So one of the key points on this other side, well, kind of building blocks of all these things are these P and X's. So the sequence of these things. And the fact that we know the error between the n minus first one and the n. So we can pick pn of x and subtract pn minus one. You get the nth derivative of zero and x. As precisely these, <coughs> it's also the expansion point I'll tell you about. So it's exactly these. Things and I'm going to try and explain how you can do this in some other settings. Okay. So maybe before I tell you how it works, I should try and tell you some motivation as to why one would want it or where it becomes useful to have these things. So I always give the same motivation when I do this, but today I decided to completely change that and do a different one. So it comes from some geometry that. I don't really understand, but I will mention. So let's take our say M, some nice manifold. So it will be smooth, compact, adjectives of your choice. Then there are two spaces people are interested in. So you can look at the space. Of diffeomorphisms on a manifold N, that, let's say, respect the boundary. And you can look at the space of homeomorphisms that respect the boundary on a manifold N. So this is this side is maps from M to itself that are diffeomorphisms that respect the boundary, and you have homeomorphisms from M to itself that also respect the boundary. But these are Oops, so I can take, well, uh, I can take the classified space of these things. It's just the deal with any of them. And there's a map in this direction whose fiber, which quite leave myself in this space, is what people call Only event or event. And what this fiber is supposed to tell you is supposed to tell you the difference between smooth structures on your manifold coming from this space of diffeomorphisms and uh, topological structures coming from the space of homeomorphisms. And the point is that if you take some nice M, uh, this kind of functor, studying these functors is also a way to study these things. Okay, so what do I mean by that statement? So let's take M to be a three dimensional disk, which let me write it to be suggestive. 
you're gonna just in 4D. And remember that 4D is a real vector space. So these are all functors. So all these spaces, so all the spaces. Vectors, uh, vectors over four, let's say, is this? So, for example, you have this vector. These class size spaces with different morphisms. And what it does is send the vector space to class time space of the unit that's inside this vector space. So really any inner product space is here, but I mean we have my hands and it's that type of go away. Okay, so these are natural things people might want to study, and people have. So we haven't got very far. So let me tell you what people have used this calculus to learn about these functors. So theorem. And I'll tell you how this works a little bit later if I have time. Theorem of Hanich and Oscar Randall Williams. And what they do is they compute the homotopy groups of this space of cross space morphisms on an even dimensional disk. But they only do it rationally. So after you tensor this all with the rational numbers. So what they find that this is the rational numbers. Let me get my conditions right. Okay, is and minus one mod four and then zero. I also need k bigger than or equal to zero otherwise. And this is only for k and also a range less than three and minus six. This is a pretty drastic calculation of some groups that people really haven't understood very well. And this calculation, if you go into this paper that they've written, is essentially they differentiate the functor, this one. And to prove this, they only need the first and second derivative. So one would assume that if you can calculate higher derivatives, you can calculate better ranges of things, but the second derivatives are already quite, quite hard to compute. Any questions? Let's yeah. maybe talk a little bit about this calculus and how we can construct it. Okay, so let me talk about derivatives. Factors. Okay, so if we think about what a derivative is doing in this differential world, it's trying to measure some kind of rate of change. So how do you take a functor, let's say in some vector space, and change it by just a little bit? Well, you add on kind of the smallest vector space you can think of to add on. That's non-trivial. If we just add on, let's just say a copy of four, that's just working with this. So here's our thing we want a slight increase in it, but a slight change in it. You want to look at the, the difference between these two things, right? Because that's exactly what the derivative that I raised was doing. So in homotopy theory, the only way to do that is well, the amount here coming from the inclusion of this vector space into this vector. So we can just look at the fiber of this thing. And this is what people call F on B. And this fiber is the first derivative. Oh, right. 
see if this makes sense, we can do is you can think about what it would mean for a functor to be a uh, constant, right? It would mean that this map is an equivalence in some homotopy theoretic sense. So let's say homotopy equivalence. So if this map is a homotopy equivalence, then the fiber is contractible, which tells you that the first derivative of a constant functor is zero. I mean, in another way, it doesn't work, so the analogy breaks a little bit, but for the majority of the time, the analogy works. So to get the second derivative, we have to use a fact. It's kind of the, the crux of this whole proving that any of this thing work is the following fact that I'm just going to very swiftly brush under the rug and pretend is obvious. So this functor, the only thing about this is a functor from vector spaces, spaces, and um, has what are called structure maps. It maps from some some vector space D. We take this expansion of it. And get a map with I on B plus four. And now we're going to play kind of the scene trick about looking at a map and taking fibers to get the second derivative. This map induces the map like this. Yeah, I didn't leave myself in space. This is by the fact that loops are joined to suspension. And if we take the fiber of this map, this is what people call second derivative, and so on. In particular, the nth derivative of your functor is a fiber sequence with the n minus first derivative. Superscript at minus one over there. I ah, guess. Okay. So the design is omega n minus one. Yes. So I just pick loops and just keep looping it. <laughs> Okay, so this tells you, well, not this, but the point over here was that if this map is an equivalence, i.e. that functor is constant, then the first derivative vanishes. So we want some kind of condition of some kind of map being an equivalence to induce that the nth derivative vanishes, and that tells you what the n minus one point of that thing should be. So this all comes in another. Result that I'm going to. Question? Oh, you're good. Okay. Okay, so there's a another non trivial thing written by Michael Bias. It's got to come from all this. And it tells you there's a fiber sequence. So it goes from the example's first derivative is the fiber of a map from f of d into what's called tau and f of d, um, where this tau n is just some functor from the category of functors.
it's up. The particular definition of this tile line isn't really enlightening unless I have another R. So um, can I just assume that there's a sumter in it? And it's just in a fiber sequence with the amplitude first derivative. All I have is such that I'm but the right hand side has no n. Yes, because it is it's a it's a functor here. And what the functor does involves the n. Uh, it's an it's, element, it's only equality with one of the Yes, sorry, that yeah, that does work. It's an endo functor on this category. It's not this is not right, right? It's not an element of that. It's a functor from that category to itself. I mean, the colon was correct. It was misread as an equality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the n is 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 hidden from from our view right now, but for for good reason. Because it's kind of ugly. So this kind of tells us what an n polynomial thing should be if we want to make the n plus first derivative vanish. So, after is an polynomial, and if the map this right hand map in this fiber sequence is an equivalent for all. Any questions? Okay. So now what are the equivalents of these PM things? Well, time for another non-aligning definition. Uh, PM of f is the co-limit of five of this fixed power and he's applying it. So what you're supposed to think of is that this functor tau n, every time you apply it to a functor, it makes it closer and closer to being something that looks n -functor. So if I apply it infinitely many times, I get something that is n -functor. So some facts with this PM of F is it here. So facts. So PM of F is M polynomial. And it is the, the closest M polynomial functor to that. Which means that if I have a map from F to something else that's M polynomial, it has to factor through this piano, at least up to some notion of the top. So our table gets filled in by these. So that's fine, that's construction. You can do it. it. Doesn't tell you anything about how to calculate anything, right? It's the problem in this. I hit in this functor because it's kind of gross to calculate it, and then I took a big infinite cohen of it, so it becomes worse to calculate it. So we have to figure out something. I guess if you have one takeaway from my talk, it's just if you have some maps, take fibers on it. So there's a map. From or n into or n plus one, and lots of them. And let's just say onto the first n coordinates. And this induces a map from PM of f to PM minus one of f. 
So you can then look at the fiber of this. This is what people call a D on the And it is the fiber of this map. This is supposed to be the same thing as taking the little PM minus one in ordinary calculus away from the little PM. The home to be theoretic notion of like minus. And the good news is that this thing is actually something that people can calculate. So in the case that um, our field is the rash or the real number is just some mental bias. And um, I did it for the complex numbers in my thesis. And I guess that has two parts. Let's just take the real version of everything. So the first thing is that um, this functor, which is a functor from vector spaces. This is completely determined by a thing that people call partial end of that. And this thing is a spectrum. Our only cohomology theories we've had from part one. So the spectrum, and it's slightly more than a spectrum, the spectrum that has an action of the um symmetric group of band letters on it. Oh no, it doesn't. Wrong calculus. It's an action of the orthogonal group. And in particular, the value of this uh, nth layer part uh, is the infinite loop space spectrum. So I take my spectrum over here. I've suspended a bunch of times depending on my vector space. And I just kill any orthogonal group actions. And this thing is something that people can actually sit down and calculate. And calculate in the homogeneous theoretic sense to tell you that this spectrum is not a spectrum. Oh, yeah. So this fills in this bit. This is this infinite loop space, of whatever. So let me finally tell you about the K theory for some description. Seven minutes. Okay. So part three. Theory. Remember our little friends, these maps? The one induced from complexification and the one induced from forgetting the complex structure. So these come from maps on vector spaces. So we Just complexification for getting complex structure. And so we can induce maps from functors So the forgetting the complex structure induces a map from functors from Real vector spaces function complex vector spaces just by precomposing with this guy. And precomposition gives you, with complexification, gives you a function in the direction. Okay, so what we're going to see is that actually these 
these two things, just these three composition functors, give some nice relationships between calculus over the real numbers and calculus over the complex numbers. Last theorems. Also, in my thesis. Okay, so the first one is if I have some functor, let's say, starts off in real vector spaces and goes to this distance, which is nice. Then, if I look at the, the nth approximation of this function, so this is in this calculus over four, and then move it to calculus over C, but just precomposing with this function, I get the nth approximation of the function in calculus over C if I had a move the functor originally. So in particular, this spectrum I got at the end for the, the functor in the orthogonal version move this integrator has this over C is just, I just changed the group action. But I always do a TM, what you would call a PM. Oh yeah. That was a mistake. Okay, so the nth approximation of a functor in orthogonal calculus moved to unitary is the nth approximation of the functor after you've moved it. And the derivative is you just well take the derivative of your functor f of the spectrum we get at the end, just take the spectrum that we get and just change the group action from an orthogonal group action to a unitary group action. The other functor that's one induced from complexification is less nice. So let's say now we have something from complex vector spaces, this business, which is again some kind of nice. Then what can we say? Well, we can take the tenth approximation of this thing and move it to the calculus on the real numbers. And this turned out to be the two nth approximation of the counter after we moved it. So whereas this one completely recovers everything you would want to know, this one skips all the odd layers, which is unfortunate, but the case. And what you should think of is if you think of this on the level of vector spaces. So if I start with a real vector space, complexify it, I get something with the same dimension. And then forget it, I get something twice the dimension. If I do the same thing here, but I first use this precomposition with this one, and then this one, I double polynomial degree. So I get the same functor, I've just moved itself to a different polynomial part. All right, and I will stop there. Okay. Any questions? What is nice? Nice is a bunch of technical conditions. So the first one says that it's um, zero to polynomial approximation is trivial, so it's reduced. And the second one tells is basically that you know the connectivity of the map from the functor to its nth approximation. 